Uh, outside influence is good. I think that we should uh, emphasize outside recruitment. I think we need to send people out, which is something that I started in the school with some funds to support more outside activity, more visibility, more presentations. We need to get people out to see what's going on. I think when people go out, they see good things and, and they bring those back, but they also are happy to come home because they like what's going on here. I think that's, that's a positive uh, feature. But we are still isolated. Uh, lack of a facility here is huge um, and cannot be uh, ignored. Uh, the, the, if you just sort of have in your visual imagery the sudden appearance uh, on the UMC campus of a 250,000 square foot facility with uh, beautiful new medical education rooms, a huge multi-specialty clinic, and clinical research facilities with a big sign on it that says University of Nevada School of Medicine. Just think how that would change uh, what it feels like here. And that's the goal, and we're underway to solve that, but that's not gonna be solved anytime soon. So it is a huge issue to, to not have those facilities. Should we have started that five years ago? Sure. Ten years ago? Sure. Fifteen years ago? We didn't. We will now. More immediate weaknesses. Uh, our IT infrastructure for the school um, is okay relative to the rest of the university, but for the practice plan is miserable. Huge weakness. Now part of this is my sensitivity because I come from a place that is uh, IT intensive and practice plan intensive and has very sophisticated IT systems and quality systems. Um, and it's a huge loss not to have because we are way behind, hugely behind. Uh, we're behind in terms of quality measures, we're behind in terms of the ability to uh, reward physicians appropriately for their productivity, we're behind uh, in terms of leaving money on the table. Um, so in many regards, the lack of, of infrastructure, both practice management and clinical is a huge problem. Now I said under strengths that we have uh, multiple hospital partners and that was listed as a strength. It's also a weakness. The fact that we're split campuses, that we have uh, different types of partners on the two campuses, that we have different types of relationships on the two campuses is um, a huge, huge problem. And finally, under weaknesses, I'll give you a sort of a more of a metaphysical kind of a weakness and that is that History, uh, I think to this point, has been a weakness. And the reason I say that is not because of what happened in history, but by how we interpret it. So what I experience when I come into a lot of meetings, and I have to tell you that every single meeting in the last 16 months has started with history. I don't know if you just really love this stuff, or uh, <laughs> you know, if you have particularly strong teaching in uh, your K-12 education around history or what, but uh, this, this state is really into its history. And the problem with that is that history is quite often used as a ceiling instead of a floor. History is portrayed as, here's the best we can do, here's what's happened in the past, this is as good as we can get. And, and quite often the conversation has the potential to stop there. I'm going to get back in a second to what I think should be the case, which is history is the floor. History is the place you start, not the place you end. All right, opportunities. I think the biggest opportunity is that I feel, in the last six or eight months, a convergence of vision. I feel like a lot of different constituencies, from regents to county commissioners to hospital leaders to the faculty to the staff, uh, and even some outside agencies, nonprofit groups, uh, some state legislators, I feel like there's a convergence of vision that for whatever reason, many groups have decided this is a window of time to actually do something right for the school. I think there's a realization of the importance of the school uh, to the state, to the state's health, and to the state's uh, health care. Um, and opportunity is the fact that the state fares so poorly in rankings of health care. And we are 50th in lots of things. And the state in the uh, indicators in which we're not 50th, we're 51st because they count the District of Columbia. So uh, we have big troubles, and I just think the state cannot afford that. I think this is an economic issue. I think this is a productivity issue. I think it's a business issue in terms of attracting businesses. I think the school plays a role in that, and I think that the school has some traction around that issue. I think there's uh, opportunities for tremendous growth. Class size can grow 
faculty has to grow with that, facilities have to grow with that, uh, research has to grow uh, with that. Um, so this, this, the, the dynamics all point towards growth as a major issue. I think the economy could improve modestly over time. Hopefully we've bottomed out. Hopefully we've, uh, we've hit the nadir and, and we're on our way uh, back up. I think there are new partnerships forging with our hospital partners uh, in different ways around different issues, but St. Mary's, Renown, UMC, all three, plus some outside partnerships in both communities, uh, suggest that maybe there's some new, new opportunities there as well. And philanthropy is huge. So uh, I spend a lot of my time with donors, real donors, potential donors, talking about donors, planning for events with donors. Uh, it's a huge, issue, and I think there's much to be gained there. The state has a lot of private money into which uh, the school could, could tap. But that leads to the critical issue of, uh, of branding and identity, of people really understanding that there's a school here and they really have, have a school. Okay, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. I break those into two categories, internal and external. The internal threats um, are that I think we're very balkanized. I think that there are lots of good people doing lots of good work who have no idea what's going on in the rest of the school. Lots of disconnects. Uh, I find myself all the time explaining to somebody about somebody else, and they too have no idea what each other is doing. And that's not just a north-south issue, that's within each campus or outside opportunities that, that you know, pop up. And I think that's probably an inevitable consequence of the Tremendous pressures that you've been under, tremendous stresses, and you just sort of hunker down, do your work, but I think it's kind of disconnected people up here a bit. Like all organizations, there's a fear of change. That's not specific to us, that's true for all organizations. I think it's particularly threatening, though, when it's a time of resource constraint and there's a feeling of difficulty in thinking big and thinking about the things that we can do. And there's a Another piece to that that I think is a bit more specific uh, to this organization, and that is I think we've been risk averse uh, over the past many years. Um, you all know of many opportunities that may have gone wanting uh, over the last few years, and I have um, come across many of those in my travels, some of which I think we are recovering, uh, but not all of which probably can be recovered. But I have had many meetings and many conversations that revolve around the issue of, well, you know uh, this opportunity was out there for the school two years ago, five years ago, seven years ago, and it didn't happen. Now, I'm pretty sure, based on some of those discussions, that there's some real good reasons why those, that the school did not take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and so I think that's smart sometimes, but I think we have been a little resistant to that. External threats, overwhelmingly, uh, the external threats are two. Secular trends in healthcare, I'll come back to that, and the super committee failure and federal budget issues. Huge issues that are, that are threats. So, secular trends. Healthcare reform, one way or another, by design, by default, by executive uh, direction, by Congress, by the Supreme Court, healthcare reform is coming, one way or another. And the reason for that is that it's unaffordable and unsustainable. So that means value-based purchasing, uh, an extreme focus on quality measures for reimbursement um, and for supporting uh, the financial base of healthcare, uh, pay for performance schemes of all kinds, physician, um, hospital, um, integration organizations, accountable care organizations, um, other ACO light uh, type activities. Uh, this is coming one way or another. And we are in a deficit in that regard. We do not have the strong partnerships with hospitals that we need to have that kind of integration. As I already said, we have no uh, IT to really support the kinds of quality measures and productivity measures that we need to have. So uh, we are uh, very threatened by uh, some of this. And then the budget issues. Federal budget issues are uh, an extraordinary problem. If the super committee failure kicks in like it's supposed to, 25% cut in GME, uh, probably a similar cut in real spending power in uh, NIH, uh, and similar cuts in the level of reimbursement for government-sponsored government health care. So the feds cut their support, states cut their support, everything goes downhill. 
and that will just destroy um, most academic medical medical organizations without really significant responses. And again, we're not in the best shape to respond to that. All right, now I um, did solicit, as some of you know, uh, questions from the group. It wasn't uh, the most <coughs> robust response, shall we say, but um, we got a few. And I appreciate that. I hope we can encourage more of that uh, in the future. But I got several questions around the following topics. How to balance academic and clinical missions, uh, support for clinical research specifically, uh, how to improve our clinical operations and quality of our care. A lot of questions about uh, the presence in Las Vegas facilities, uh, visibility, residency expansion, uh, some questions about medical school growth, uh, and then finally some questions about our identity and our brand. So that rolls into a larger vision that I want to lay out for you. As I said, uh, I want history to be the ceiling. I want history to be the beginning. I want to learn from it, and then I want to move on. And I think that's, that's critical. I think for a variety of reasons, uh, not mostly of your own making, uh, the school has been kind of on hold for a period of time. Uh, and as I said, people just kind of settle down, do their work. Uh, we need to sort of think big, and we need to think in exciting ways, in very targeted ways. Uh, I think we can achieve that excellence in all regards, but it has to be very targeted excellence. The phrase is, we can do anything we want, we just can't do everything we want. So we have to be very careful about what we take on, very careful about our focus, uh, so that everything we do is quality. Quality always over quantity. So that we're very attentive uh, to uh, quality in all of our uh, operations. The biggest gap that I see, the biggest hole in the system, uh, is clinical research. And I've said this several times, and, and I know some of you have heard that before. Basic science research for a school of this size is very strong. Clinical practice plan, good base of operations, we can grow and get better. Commitment to education, wonderful. The missing hole is clinical translational research. Clinical research is what people know, what patients know, what shows up on the news, what shows up on the radio, what shows up on CNN. This is how patients and uh, uh, donors know most medical schools, and we are very lucky in that regard. That relates, however, to our basic science research enterprise. And I know that's not a big function for, um, for Las Vegas, but you need to understand what's going on in Reno in that regard. Uh, basic science um, uh, faculty members are going through a very intense process of looking at their operations, looking how to organize themselves. Their current model is not sustainable. Um, NIH funding and other uh, pipeline issues for recruitment are just not sustainable under the, under the current arrangements. And so we have to work very hard to be able to enhance that, uh, that system. I think we will continue to, to maintain educational excellence. You've already demonstrated your ability to do that. I have no concerns about that. But we need to not lose it as we focus more on the practice plan and focus more on clinical research. So educational excellence uh, is still a foundation to which you have all committed. That relates to growth in the medical school class size. That'll definitely happen. Some people would say, well, why do that? Why not increase residency and fellowships? And the answer is the way we can increase residencies and fellowships, both quality and quantity, is by increasing the medical school pipeline and having an increasing number of medical students coming into our programs. I think the vision includes stronger partnerships, and that's partnerships with our uh, hospital partners, that's partnerships with community physicians, partnerships with other medical uh, organizations in the area. Um, we have to really uh, learn how to be good partners, and I think we have been in certain regards in the past, but not in others. And again, I hear that frequently, a lot of feedback about ways that we did not follow through, we did not deliver on um, some of the opportunities that were, were out there.